All right, if you got your Bibles, you ready? Open to Psalm 51, Psalm 51, and then Genesis 27. Uh, we're going to continue our story of Jacob and Esau, and we've kind of gotten to a point where Rebecca, who we gave a little bit of a hard time about a month ago when we talked about her portion of the story, Rebecca is going to reset the ship, and she's going to do right in the lesson that we go through today. And honestly, uh, we can really learn uh, from her initiative and the way that she is redeemed uh, through the story that we go through. So here's the deal. The first question as we get started is this. Have you ever needed a cord, but it was badly tangled? All right. You ever needed a cord, but it was badly tangled? Uh, let's just be honest. Any of you like us have a cord drawer at your house? Does anybody have the cord drawer? Raise your hand. There's a few of us there where you think to yourself, that 1996 iPhone charger, I'm going to need it at some point. You know what I mean? So you just, you keep that cable, even though you've never used them. You just keep all that stuff together. And then you need one one day. And you try to get it out, but it's like this huge rubber band ball, you know, of, of cords. And you just, there's one specific cord that you need. And I don't know about you, but I think to myself, would it be better if I just threw it away and then if I went and bought another cord? But then your brain thinks about it and it's like, man, cords are expensive. And if I just do a little bit of work, I can get the cord uh, out of the ball mess uh, and it can be useful once again. Some of you have that day at the, have that at Christmas. You ever gotten the Christmas lights out before and they're all just a big jumbled mess and you think to yourself, it's $2.99 at Walmart or do I take the time to work on every single bulb and make sure that everything is fit together? The worst, it's changed now with earbuds, but do y'all remember when headphones had those real thin wires that came down? I'm telling you, those real thin wires, all you had to do is pull just a little too hard and they would snap. I'm telling you, every time you think to yourself, would it be better if I just went to the dollar store, if I went somewhere else and I started over with something new? I got something to tell you today. Our God created the universe. And he can truly create something from nothing. And sometimes because we have that attitude of, should I just throw it away and start over? We can think to ourselves that God operates in the same manner. That when we screw up, that when we mess up, that when we have a past, that God looks at us and goes, you know, it'd just be better if I started over and didn't try at all. I got good news for you today. God loves to redeem and restore things. Amen. He loves to take things that are broken and put them back together. Try to think of it this way. God doesn't see you as a paper plate in the kitchen. He truly sees you as something of value, and you are worth going after, worth so much that he sent his son Jesus after you. Let's look real quick. Psalm chapter 51, verses 6 through 8. David, when he's at his absolute lowest point, here's what David says. David gets caught in sin uh, with Bathsheba. He's committed adultery. Uh, and then he commits murder of her husband and then covers it up. And Nathan the prophet calls him out. But honestly, leading up to Psalm 51, he's also gotten involved in polygamy. Uh, he's also, again, uh, just kind of lived fast and loose in the kingdom where uh, he's uh, he acted like he was his own God. And then all of a sudden he gets caught in the middle of it. And here's what he prays, verses 6 through 8. He says, Lord, surely you desire truth in the inner parts. He said, you teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Look at this. Cleanse me with hyssop. Underline, cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness, and let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Stop right there for just a minute. David, when caught in his sin, looking at God and going, could you ever use me after the mess that I've made, after the, the mistakes that I've made, after the past that I bring with me into the future? David looks at God and says, God, clean me up. My inmost parts, I want to be pure and useful to you again. And then he says... Cleanse me with hyssop. You know what hyssop is? Hyssop during this day and time was used specifically for gut health and also for your lungs. Isn't that interesting? He says, cleanse me with hyssop. This idea of not just my inmost parts, but he says, clean up my organs on the inside. The things that are working to keep me alive. And don't miss this image. A brother last service reminded me. Don't miss the illustration too. When the plague of the firstborn happened in Exodus, do you remember what they dipped in blood to put the lamb's blood over the doorway? They dip the hyssop into the blood. In Psalm 51, is David saying, it's an allusion to the Messiah. Cleanse me as only you can cleanse me. Make me whiter than snow. And then he says a beautiful verse, verse 8, that's one of my favorites. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. If you've been around Waterfront long enough, you've heard this before. 
Uh, my dad, when I was growing up, didn't give us stories of dragons and vampires and whatnot. Uh, my dad had, uh, was all but dissertation for his PhD in Roman law. So we got warrior battle patterns and all that stuff. And one of my dad's favorite stories to tell us when I was a kid was the story of the crushed bones in Psalm 51.8. The picture in Psalm 51.8 is in an ancient, uh, in an ancient culture. Whenever the uh, group would go out to fight, uh, they usually would fight during the summer months. And what they would do is they would fight for months at a time, and then they would work their way back so that then they could plant crops, and in the winter months, uh, they, could, they could settle, calm down, and then get ready for the fight that was going to happen the following summer. Well, sure enough, in this passage, David is looking and saying this to God. He says, Lord, I'm like a warrior where I was fighting on the first day of battle on our journey. And all of a sudden, as I'm fighting, my arm was broken. And instead of being able to call a timeout or go to the medical tent, they need me as a number for us to represent our village. And he says, I just wrapped my arm up, and then I fought through with a broken arm for the next several months. Well, if you do that without resetting the bone, then, man, it grows back together wrong. He said, that warrior comes back after months of battle and says to his best of friends, stick an arrowhead in my mouth, give me a little shot of whiskey, and then if you love me, you will break my bone and reset it so that by the time we go out next summer, my bone will have grown back together strong and I'll be able to fight at full force again. David says to God, you clean me up inside. Even my organs, even my spirit cleanse me with hyssop. But then he says, get in my face about my character. He says, if it betters me for your kingdom, break my bone and let the bone you have crushed rejoice. That's a pretty powerful word, isn't it? There's some of you who come in today and sin of lifestyle has set in and your bone has grown back together wrong. I got good news for you today. God doesn't just want to throw you out. He loves you enough to redeem you. But he's got to bring our sin to the surface before he does that. If you're taking notes, write this down. Are you ready? Never forget that God, who has the power to create from nothing, loves us enough to choose to restore and redeem us. Let me say it again. Never forget that God, who has the power to create from nothing, loves us enough to choose to restore and redeem us. He cleanses us all the way on the inside, organs and all, spirit and and all. And then he breaks our bones so that we can be strong again. So it begs the big million dollar question today. How does God start the redemption process? How does God start this process of redeeming us? If again, he could just create something from nothing, how does he do this in so many lives? And how can he do this in my life today? Look with me, if you will, at Genesis 27. And we're going to start in verse 41. Now, in the weeks leading up to this, we've been going through the story of Jacob and Esau. And remember, we've gotten to the point where uh, Rebecca, the mother, and Isaac, the father, Rebecca's favorite's Jacob. He's the homebody. And uh, Isaac's favorite is Esau. Esau's the man's man. He's big and strong, and he's hairy. Uh, again, I identify with him. All right, I identify with Esau. And so all that to say, you've got this situation where Jake, or, uh, uh, Isaac then says, hey, I'm going to bless you, Esau, as the head of the family. It's a big, important moment. Uh, but Esau has not made good decisions. He's not valued the covenant with Yahweh up until this point. Uh, uh, and so all of a sudden, uh, his mom, Rebecca, says, let's figure out a plan to trick Isaac, who's uh, weak in his eyesight. Let's figure out a way to trick him into blessing Jacob and basically giving him the farm and giving him uh, all of the uh, uh, everything that we have under our control. And then uh, we can kind of cut Esau out. Well, the problem is their plan succeeds but Esau is still there, and he's the big and strong one. And so Esau is angry with the way this has come together, and it's caused a massive rift in their family. Look at what happens at Genesis, 24, or Genesis 27, uh, verse 41. It says, After this, Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. He said to himself, I know what he said to himself, The days of mourning my father are near, then I will kill my brother Jacob. It says, when Rebekah was told about her older son Esau and what he had said, underline she was told, she sent for him, she sent for her younger son Jacob and said to him, your brother Esau is consoling himself with the thought of killing you. Now stop right here for just a minute. 
We've said a lot of tough things about Rebecca and also about Jacob and also about Isaac and even about Esau through these studies and passages. What Rebecca does today is so powerful and we should follow her example. After this mess that she's made and been part of, after all the struggle that's taken place, all of a sudden she hears somehow Esau is saying to himself that he's going to wait till his father dies and then he's going to kill Jacob. Now I want you to notice something. It says that he's saying this to himself. But it then says that Rebekah hears about it. Now, here's what's interesting. Does that mean that Esau is like staring into a pond and saying it to himself? Does it mean that he's mumbling it under his breath? Does it mean that the Spirit has revealed this to Rebekah? The cool part about this story is we don't know. We just know that Esau is trying to hide this sin, and somehow, some way, God brings it to the surface so that it can be dealt with. Sometimes, whenever our sin comes to the surface, we get so angry with God because it's like, oh, why did you have to expose me in this mess? God doesn't expose our sin because he hates you. God allows our sin to be exposed so that he can cleanse us and make us whole once again. If you're taking notes, write this down. How does God start the redemption process? Number one, God reveals our hidden sin stronghold. God reveals our hidden sin stronghold. He brings the truth up to the surface. It's not because he hates you. Sometimes in this city, because we are such an image-driven community, Sometimes we feel like that when some of the mess comes to the surface, it's like, oh, why would God allow me to be embarrassed that way? If sin is the root, he's not trying to embarrass you. He loves you enough to help you, to bring it up so that you don't have to live in that mess any longer. So back in the day, uh, before kids, my wife and I loved to, this is really creepy, okay, but Autumn and I used to love to go to cemeteries. Did you ever do that? Any, any of my cemetery folks in here? Okay, just a few of us. Robbie, Robbie just did like this. Okay, there you go. It's a good, good move not to identify yourself. All right, there you go. Anyway, uh, all that to say, you're driving across Texas. Okay, Texas is wide open. There's not much to do uh, in, in parts of West Texas, but there's some really old, crazy cemeteries, and sometimes if you walk around, you can see like feuds that were going on uh, because one cemetery in particular in Yukon, Oklahoma, there's one brother that was buried on this end of the cemetery facing this way and another brother buried on the opposite end of the cemetery facing the other way. And so you can kind of research and figure out all these stories. Well, anyway, we see one that's assigned for an old church. And any of you who've ever kind of driven in a rural area like that, we drove across a cattle guard following the sign, which means we were probably on somebody's property uh, at this point. But we drive over, we find this cemetery, and uh, I'm wearing flip-flops and shorts, and so is Autumn. Well, sure enough, we start walking through, and there's a little old church, but then at the back of the cemetery, there are these concrete, uh, stone, con- stone concrete boxes that are like raised up mausoleum things. And so these, these big coffins. And so we're like, that's crazy. We got to go check those out. So we're walking through dodging ant beds and all that stuff. This is a very, very old cemetery. You've got Civil War soldiers that have been buried there. And then as we walked to the back, I wanted to see what was in the, the case. Well, one of the concrete boxes was busted at the top so that you could see inside. And so I creep up, and as I peek over the edge to what should my wondering eyes should appear, all right, but about 100 rattlesnakes right there in that big, co- that big coffin. And here's the deal. They're piled on top of each other. It was a den. That particular day we were out there was over 100 degrees outside. They had found the shade right there on that little stone or concrete backdrop where they were cooling down. And when I saw those snakes, I was so terrified. Because remember, I'm dressed like not for it at all. With snakes, you don't wear flip-flops and shorts with a whole bunch of rattlesnakes around. And my thought was, if there's 100 in there, there's probably at least one out here. And so all of a sudden, I start running like this. Like, I didn't want to step up. I look like I'm leading the band. You know what I mean? Just going that way. And so I just start running away as quick as I can. Sure enough, I get over there, and Autumn is like, what are you doing? And I said, there's a hundred snakes over there in that deal. And my wife goes, no way. And she walks over there to check it out because that's who I married. Anyway, I just want you to know that, okay? Here's the picture. Looks like a cemetery, calm, peaceful, right? When you get up close, there's a whole bunch of snakes, a whole bunch of rattlesnakes. And I'm telling you, danger right there lurking just beneath the surface. In our lives, when the Lord allows things that look calm and peaceful, but there's a den of rattlesnakes in your life, God loves you enough 
to allow the truth to come to the surface so that then you can deal with it. He doesn't do that because he hates you. He does it because he loves you. If you don't take anything else away from today, I hope you'll take this line. You ready? To make something useful again, redemption and restoration require removal of the rot. Let me say that again. To make something useful again, redemption and restoration require removal of the rot. God reveals our sin stronghold, and it's so that it can be cleaned up and made useful again. Jesus says it this way. Save your spot in Genesis 27, but flip over to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. When Jesus is washing his disciples' feet, he gives us a powerful illustration here. This is literally just hours before he goes to the cross. In John chapter 13, verses 6 through 8, he's washing his disciples' feet. It says, he came to Simon Peter, verse 6, who said, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, Peter said, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you will have no part with me. Now stop right there for just a minute. When the cleanup work comes to the surface, you guys are all godly. You guys are all, again, hardworking, great people. And so because of that, we don't want to be a burden to anybody else. And Peter vocalizes for us exactly the way most of us feel. Lord, you shouldn't have to wash my feet. Again, these other guys, maybe, all right? But for me, I'm a leader. I'm one who knows better. You don't have to wash my feet. And Jesus looks at him and says, even you, Peter, who have I've called the rock, who I've said on you, I'm going to build this amazing church. He looks at Peter and says, if I don't wash you, you will have no fellowship with me. You will have no relationship with me. And he loves him enough to say, you got to let me clean you up. And that may be the word that God is speaking to some of you who've been Christians a long time today. He's letting you know, I've got to clean you up so that our relationship, our fellowship can be unhindered and we can be together once again. It begs the question, is it time you let Jesus clear out the rod? Is it time you let Jesus clear out the rod? Autumn and I had a great privilege for five spring breaks to get to go and serve in uh, New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. And it's interesting, five spring breaks, we do a whole week's worth of work. It was so special. Worked with Habitat for Humanity and also a group called Baptist Crossroads and Musicians Village. Uh, It was a deal that was founded by Harry Connick Jr. and Bradford Marcellus. Wonderful organization. We had the best time. Um, The first year that we went down, I had never seen anything like it. When you went into the upper ninth ward where we were building the houses, they received between four and eight feet of water in the upper ninth ward. But the lower ninth ward, it was 20 feet of water from Lake Pontchartrain that came and flooded that area. Just completely destroyed. And anything that wasn't stone or rock or metal, I mean, all that wood just completely and totally destroyed because it was saturated for so long. For three years... We went down, and all we did was clear out rot. Three spring breaks, three years' worth, and we would just be clearing out busted sheetrock. We'd be clearing out moldy wood, and everything was about clearing out the rot. And then the last two years that we went, we got to build on what had been cleared, and it was amazing. In fact, some of the stuff, I got to go down to New Orleans a few years ago. We built sheds in the backyards of several of those houses Autumn and I did together, and the sheds are still standing, which I thought was pretty cool because I've never built anything that lasted. And so, uh, (laughs) other than maybe Waterfront Church, that's about it. When we went through, it was just amazing to see. There was a church in the Lower Ninth Ward, still there to this day. Church was in 20 feet of water, and when we went in the first time, we took pictures. We went in the first time, Lower Ninth Ward, it was so just destroyed. It had been sitting when we got there to view it for the first time for five months, just completely saturated. And I'll never forget, out in front, the pastor of that church had put up a sign with the verses from Ezekiel, Oh Lord, can these bones live? And you got to see a living example right there. All that was left after they cleared it out were the stone and the iron pillars that were holding the church up. And now to this day, the church meets there for services. They re-put it together, and it's an amazing spot. In your life, God desires to redeem you. He could, at the snap of his fingers, just create another paper plate, but you are so much more important than a paper plate. He loves you, 
and he desires to see you back in fellowship with him. He doesn't care what you've done. Jesus died for all of it. Flip back over to Genesis 27 and let's see what happens next. Genesis 27, now let's look at verses 43 through 45. So Rebekah calls over Jacob, says Esau is consoling himself with the thought of killing you. Verse 43, now then, my son, do what I say. Flee at once to my brother Laban in Haran. Stay with him for a while until your brother's fury subsides. And when your brother is no longer angry with you and he forgets what you did to him, I'll send word for you to come back here. Now look at this. Why should I lose both of you? In one day. I want you to stop right there for just a minute. We've been going through every verse that has Rebecca in it up until this point in the study. Not once up until this point has she showed any love or concern for Esau. But after deciding to do the right thing, the sin in the family that's been exposed, all of a sudden she looks at Jacob and says, We got two options here. Either we can plan to kill your brother, but then you'll get picked up by the local magistrates and then you'll be taken away to prison. She goes, or well, the other option is I let him kill you and then he gets taken off to prison or he is on the run from the Lord and his spirit for the rest of his days. She goes, I would like for this to be fixed. And you know what? I don't just love you, Jacob. I love Esau as well. What's happened here for Rebecca is so beautiful. Sometimes when we start running down the path of sin, Things that are abnormal start to seem so normal, but then in a moment of clarity, when God reveals the sin struggle, when he exposes the pit of vipers in our lives that can hurt others, that cause danger for those around us, all of a sudden, God brings the world back into focus, and we're able to see things clearly again. In Rebecca's case, that she loved her sons, not just one, but both of them. If you're taking notes, how does God start the redemption process? Number one, he reveals our hidden sin stronghold. And number two, God recalibrates our view of the world. God recalibrates our view of the world. <laughs> so back in the day, um, my car when I was in high school was a 1995 Mitsubishi Mirage. All right. Uh, Mitsubishi Mirage, very small. It was bright red, too. Uh, I think we'd gotten it for, for $5,000, uh, this little car. And uh, it, I mean, it was so small. If you go back and look at the Mirages, it was so small. It had like go-kart tires on it. You know, it was just a very, very small car. And so I would zip around Lubbock in it. Well, early driving, I hit a curb, okay, at, at one point. And again, if you'd hit the curb in like a truck or an SUV or even a normal-sized car, it wouldn't have done anything to it. But it messed up my alignment in the car. Now, here's the thing about messed up alignment. Have you ever been in a car with messed up alignment before? It's not so bad when you're just kind of putting through town. But once I got over 40 miles an hour, I mean, that wheel just shook, just, just like, like crazy. And the first time that happened, I was like, the car's going to blow up. You know what I mean? This is not a good situation. But I did what most young people do whenever the car starts to shake like that. I was like, well, it's still driving, nothing smoking. I can probably just keep going. And so I just kept going for a couple of different weeks. Well, finally, my mom gets in the car with me. And as we get over 40 miles an hour and the wheel starts to shake, she goes, what is going on with your car? I was like, well, I hit a curb, but this is just how things do now. You know, this is just how it goes. <laughs> she goes, let's take it to the dealership and let's get it fixed. And I was like, I don't have the money for that. She's like, it's not expensive to get the alignment fixed. And sure enough, back then, this will show you inflation too. It's like 50 bucks, I think. Well, the guy who was working at the dealership looked at me and he said, son, he goes, I want to show you something. He said, just so you know, next time your wheel starts to shake, why this is important. They lifted the car up, and he said, I want you to look at how you have balded the inside of your tires from driving with that. He goes, if you had driven it much longer, he said, you wouldn't just be paying 50 bucks for the alignment. He said, you'd be buying brand new tires for each part of the vehicle. He goes, and also, you're going to have to get new brakes at some point because it was tougher on the brakes for them to have this problem as well. He goes, the alignment is a really big deal. And so here's the picture. When God exposes a sin struggle in our lives, he doesn't just expose it and go, good luck, have at it. No, he provides an opportunity for us to get in alignment with him once again so that we can drive stronger and faster. Again, David's saying, break my bone if you have to. Put the car in the shop so that I can be bigger and stronger for you again. I don't want this to keep me from fellowship with you any longer. If you're taking notes, write this down. Through the word, or through, though the world can certainly be complicated, 
Right and wrong should never be fuzzy for someone with the Holy Spirit. Though the world can certainly be complicated, right and wrong should never be fuzzy for someone with the Holy Spirit. To ask God, what should I do in this circumstance, is something every Christian has to navigate multiple times a day. To look at God and go, what's right and what's wrong in this circumstance? Remember Pilate? What is truth, said Pilate to Jesus. If you're in that spot, then you need your alignment checked. Right and wrong should not be hard to distinguish. What we Christians battle with is we battle with better and best. We try to figure out what God's best path for our life is, what God's best plan for our life is. There shouldn't be a fight on what's right and wrong. And if you're in a circumstance where you're battling between right and wrong and it just feels fuzzy, I want to encourage you, dig deep in God's word and figure it out. Because at the end of the day, living in that fuzzy world is only going to get you snake bit later on. It's not a good situation. Megan, is that a good word? Let's keep moving. Uh, by the way, it, it, uh, it begs this question. Has your world gotten fuzzy? Has your world gotten fuzzy? If so, let God reveal the sin stronghold and then allow him to recalibrate your life. How do we do that? Well, praise God, we've got that as our last point today. You ready? Now look at Genesis 27. And let's read verse 46. Verse 46 is kind of a funny one. Um, in fact, if you take it by itself, it makes Rebecca look like a villain. Uh, but in light of everything that we've read for the last couple of months, hopefully this will make sense to you. Look at verse 46. It says, Then Rebecca said to Isaac, I'm disgusted with living because of these Hittite women. <laughs> I'm disgusted with living because of these Hittite women. If Jacob takes a wife from among them, of the women of this land, from Hittite women, like those, my life will, be, will not be worth living. Now stop right there for just a minute. At first glance, you're like, what a racist statement here from Rebecca, all right? But I need you to picture, because of what's happened in Genesis 26, do you remember what it said? That Esau has taken multiple wives from the Hittite people, and because of that, it's caused a major source of grief with Isaac and Rebekah. It's caused them difficulty. Even Isaac, who loves his son Esau, he's got problems with this because by Esau marrying the Hittite women, he has discarded the covenant with Yahweh that's the defining characteristic of their family. And since Abraham and Sarah have had this beautiful covenant with Yahweh, Yahweh. It was passed down to Isaac and Rebekah. Rebekah steps up and says, can we get real here for just a minute? I know that you know that we did this weird thing where I tried to get you to bless Jacob instead of Esau. She comes in and says, can we have some real talk? The covenant, the faith that we have as a family is not making it to the next generation. It's not being passed down to the next group. And she looks and says, can we send Jacob off so that maybe he can find a way to connect with Yahweh in the same way that your father sent the servant to find me so that I could connect with Yahweh. Can we do this together? If you're taking notes, write this down. How does God start the redemption process? Number one, he reveals our sin stronghold. Number two, he recalibrates our view of the world. And number three, God requires that we commit to live biblically. God requires that we commit to live biblically. How does God recalibrate our view of the world? We start going back to Scripture. It's the foundation for our faith and for our relationship with Jesus. Now, just for the record, living biblically doesn't save you. Only the shed blood of Jesus is what covers our sin and saves us. But living biblically is how you fulfill God's purpose for your life, how you feel whole at the end of the day. you got to make the decision that God's word is the truth and you're going to live in accordance with it. She doesn't quite word it beautifully here. But she comes back and says, can we talk about the real problem in our family? So back in the day, uh, some of you were here for this. I got very, very sick and uh, went on a mission trip to Slovakia and ate a bad piece of chicken. It happens. Um, Could have happened here in the States just as much as there. But ate a bad piece of chicken. Um, it was the one meal I ate apart from the rest of the group at the airport, of all places. Uh, and uh, when I ate the piece of chicken, uh, I got a bacteria infection called Campylobacter. It's a very, very specific bacteria infection. And so, uh, sure enough, get back here to the States. I was throwing up constantly and out the other side constantly uh, for a couple of weeks. Uh, went to the doctor 
And the doctor said, hey, it sounds to me like you just have an infection. And they gave me some penicillin. And so I'm allergic to, y'all don't care about this, but I'm allergic to z I'm allergic to azithromycin. And so um, they gave me the penicillin stuff. And so uh, I take that, but here's the problem with a bacteria infection. Bacteria is so specific that you need the good bacteria in your stomach to fight against the bad bacteria. And so when I took the penicillin, it nuked all the good uh, bacteria in my stomach. And so then the bad bacteria was running unopposed. And so uh, it meant that I didn't realize it at the time, uh, but I had blood leaving my body for about two weeks. And then finally, one night, three o'clock in the morning, my system poured red blood out of my body. Well, I've got a friend who uh, was my dad's GI when he was fighting cancer and uh, called him at three o'clock in the morning. Said, Dr. Miller, said, uh, this is just happening. What should I do? And Dr. Miller said very kindly, you idiot, go to the hospital. That was what he said. So I was like, okay. So I get an Uber, take the Uber to George Washington. And by the way, if you really get scared for your life at some point, GW Hospital is one of the finest trauma hospitals in the world. Uh, they do a great job. Uh, they saved my life. And uh, all that to say, I get to GW Hospital. When I get there, I'm telling them about what's going on. They do a couple of tests. And within two hours, they looked at me and said, uh, you have a very specific bacteria infection called Campylobacter. And they said, uh, it requires a very specific set of med medication. And then my doctor, she was awesome, did not have the best bedside manner. She looked at me and she goes, well, we're going to pump, pump this uh, antibiotic into you. She goes, uh, but in the next few hours, you'll start to feel better or you'll start to have temporary paralysis in your arms or legs. She goes, so if that starts to happen, please let us know. And then she walks out of the room. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God. Well, then our friend Ed comes in, Ed Downing, a lot of you know Ed. Ed walks in. And he just goes, hey, Zach, heard you in the hospital. You know, I'm like, I'm doing just fine. They said I might be paralyzed. I mean, it just it was one of those things, just again, just so worked up and freaked out. Well, sure enough, praise God, after three, four days, I did not have paralysis. The infection healed. And because I took the right antibiotic, it didn't come back. And it's not been something that's caused me problems. Now, listen, you can try a lot of other remedies. But if we are taking other antibiotics than God's word, you got to know. And by the way, this is not literal. This is, again, soul and figurative. If you're taking other antibiotics, you're working against the source and the solution. It may not feel like it at the time, but until we go to Scripture as our source of the truth, then we're going to be running circles around mess, and eventually it may come back to really haunt us. Any of you who've been a part of an anonymous group before, um, have heard a slogan kind of like this, but I want to speak it to you today. When it comes to sin, you choose your rock bottom. Write that down. When it comes to sin, you choose your rock bottom. I've known some people over the years, myself included, you hit rock bottom and then, man, you find a shovel and you just keep digging. You know what I mean? You get to choose what your rock bottom is. And my prayer is for some of you that today would be that day. When you allow the Lord to speak to you and you make the decision, I don't want that pit of snakes in my cemetery any longer. Again, I don't want a life uh, driving that vehicle where the wheel is shaking any longer. I want to be clean again. Hebrews 12, 1 will be our final verse today. Flip over to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, and we'll read this final verse as we close today. Hebrews 12, 1 says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. We have to make the decision that we are going to let go of sin. I've given you this example before. One of my favorite movies is Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Do you remember that one? Great movie. In fact, some would say the last decent Indiana Jones movie, all right? Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. I've not seen the fifth one yet, uh, but uh, anyway. You remember the scene? He's been seeking the Holy Grail. By the way, I'm going to spoil the movie, but you had like 30 years to see it, okay? So here's the picture. Last scene, there's the Holy Grail. It's just out of reach. And do you remember? He's reaching for it. His dad is holding on to his hand. And as he's reaching down trying to get the Grail... He wants to hold on to his father and stay alive, but the grail symbolizes the respect of his father, that he could finally have something. It's a trophy to bring home. And he reaches down, and he wants it so badly, and he goes, I can reach it, I can reach it, even though with his middle finger it's just out of reach. He can't take hold of it. And the ground's shaking, everything's falling apart, and finally his dad looks at him, and for the first time,
time. He's called him Junior the whole movie. And you remember what he says at the end? He says, Indiana finally calls him with respect by the name he goes by with his friends. He catches his son's attention and he turns. And his dad says the truth. Let it go. And he lifts up his hand. And he finds a way to life again. You see, it's not just about doing right. It's also about letting go of the sin. And that's what living biblically does for us. It helps us find the balance. For a time, we can be the cemetery that has the snake pit that hopefully nobody goes to. But the Lord desires for that mess to get cleaned up so that the whole place can be holy. So that the whole place can be a place of peace. So the writer in Hebrews says, let's throw off the sin that entangles us. Let's get rid of the mess. And I love that it starts off, we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. What God's calling you to do is not something he's not called others to do in the past. And he's calling us, let go of that life and join the chorus of heaven crying out that we are free at last. That Jesus has set us free from our sin. It begs the final question, is God calling you to commit to him today? Maybe for the first time in a long time. Maybe for the first time. Thanks for listening today. I love you guys. You waited in the rain to come to church today. Don't miss out on the blessing that God has for you. Let's bow our heads for prayer.